Brenda, would you please start us off with prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word today. Please send your Holy Spirit on Pastor Paul so that he may speak your words of love, forgiveness, and life. Send your Spirit also on us who hear that we may more fully comprehend your love for us expressed in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. All right, we are finishing up our Faithful, uh, Faithful Feelings sermon series. Uh, we've been talking about this for several weeks. Last week we talked about Faithful Feelings, glad. And we talked about the peace aspect of glad. And that, that peace is not just the absence of chaos or violence, Peace comes in the midst of that chaos. The peace of God comes in, in when the world is going to heck in a handbasket. That's when God's peace is most powerful in our lives. And God gives us his peace in the chaos of sin. And he gives us his son, Jesus Christ. And through his death and his resurrection, we experience peace for all eternity. The task for the week last week was to rest in the peace of Christ. And the question for the week, where do you need contentment in your life? Where do you need to experience the peace of Christ moving in your life? Did anyone have any thoughts or comments on that over the last week? Pam. Okay. Okay, you looked it all up. Good. Okay, if you're content, you're more likely to be a better friend. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Contentment brings less stress, sure. Yes, an overall life satisfaction is contentment and peace. Good, thank you. And that is what he wants for us, absolutely. Anyone else? Okay, then we are going to move along. We've been talking about these four categories of our emotions, our faithful feelings, mad, sad, glad, and a frad. Uh, and, and we are wrapping that up today with our final installment of GLAD. And our message title for today is Faithful Feelings, GLAD, with the hope aspect of GLAD. Now, tell me, what is hope? What is hope? That's harder to define than you might think, isn't it? Well, I found this definition of hope online a feeling of expectation or anticipation or a desire for a certain thing to happen. We might express this kind of hope in, I hope we have a snowy winter this year, or I hope we don't have a snowy winter this year, or I, I hope they cook my hamburger the way I like it, or I hope Officer Shooty doesn't pull me over for speeding. We've got a, a lot of those kinds of hopes in our lives. But we also might get this hopeful kind of feeling in Scripture. Let's take a look at a couple of them. First of all, in John chapter 5, Jesus says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees about them hoping in, in Moses and, and that they wanted something from Moses. They hoped to gain something. They were hoping that they would, that they would uh, uh, be compensated in some way. In Psalm 146, we hear a, a similar kind of hope. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord. Even in this, we, we feel like there's this, this sense of, I hope to get something 
out of it. But it's more than that. In fact, there's, from a Christian perspective, hope is different. That's the, the kind of hope that the world hopes in, kind of a cross-your-fingers kind of a hope. But there's more to hope. Now, from again, from a Christian perspective, we might, we might uh, not willingly admit this, but if you're honest with yourself, maybe sometimes you might think, well, I hope God answers my prayer. Or I hope God provides for me and my loved ones. Or I hope even, maybe we might even, if, if you ask somebody, and, and even good, good long-time, lifelong Lutheran Christians, if you said, are you going to heaven, some people might say, well, I hope so. Christian hope is not the, the hope of crossing your fingers. It is a feeling of trust and confidence. Christian hope is bigger than just that, that doubtful hope that comes along with so much of our hope. Christian hope is what we read about in our first reading here today in Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with, true, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is not a cross-your-fingers kind of a hope. This is a certainty. This is an assurance. This is hope that is beyond what the world hopes for. In fact, I would suggest to you that, that this, this crossing-your-fingers kind of hope is not a glad feeling at all. A hope like the world hopes, where there's some doubt, is, is more of a sad and mad and a frad kind of hope. The hope that we have as Christians, the glad kind of hope, is the certain hope. When we hope like the world hopes, there's that doubt. But for Christians, we have confidence, we have assurance. Jesus says in Mark chapter 13 in our gospel reading for today. And, and by the way, some of these, like, like with our peace uh, assigned readings from last week, this week they, they didn't, or last week they didn't sound real peaceful, and this week they don't sound real hopeful, at least not to begin with. Listen. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. This image of the end of time is not very hopeful. The sky is falling. The moon and the sun are darkened. The, the, the stars are falling. There's not a lot of hope here. At least yet. But Jesus then provides hope. And continuing in verse 26, And they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Jesus coming on the clouds with glory is a hopeful thing. Though the, there's doom and there's gloom in this passage, there's hope. And Jesus is trying to tell us that there is hope even in the, in the worst of times. There is hope. In fact, Jesus continues to show that hope in verse 28. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as, you, as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. We look at the, the weather warming up and winter being, I mean, not right now, right? We're just looking at winter coming. 
But in the spring, when the snow begins to melt, we, we know that the summer is near. <coughs> Excuse me. It's that, that same kind of feeling that we should have when we see the doom and the gloom in the world around us. We should have that same kind of hope, the hope that summer is near, the hope that Jesus is coming. It's the same kind of hope that we have. The doom and the gloom and the chaos and the trauma around our world, it should bring us hope. Because not there's something so much better than summer coming. Jesus is coming. When we have peace in the midst of chaos, we can have hope in the midst of hopelessness. God gives us hope when we have a world that is so hopeless. In Lamentations, and I don't know if you understand what Lamentations is a book of, but, a, but Lamentations is a book of lament, okay? A, a weeping and, and moaning and complaining. And in the, the, the middle of this great big, or it's not a great big book, but in the middle of this book of, of gloom and doom, in the very center is a message of hope. In Lamentations 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. At the very heart of the doom and gloom of our world is the hope of God for us. When the world is hopeless, we have hope. We don't have to worry about the doom and gloom. Because God the Father sent his son for us. There is eternity waiting for us. In the midst of the doom and gloom, like, like Judah and Israel there in Lamentations, complaining, we can, we can do all that same complaining and moaning and whining. But there is hope. Paul writes in Titus chapter 3, But when the goodness and love and kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Through Christ we have hope for eternal life, not just hope for tomorrow. We live in a world that, is, that, that tries to find hope in everything else. We try and find hope from our, our elections, our government, our politicians. But, but I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. It doesn't matter. There's, there's no hope beyond tomorrow for that. They might give us a little hope, but the only hope that we have for eternity is the hope of Jesus Christ. The hope of Jesus Christ and his death on a cross for our sins and his resurrection for our resurrection. That is the hope that we as Christians have. First Peter says, or Peter says in First Peter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. There's lots to, hope, uh, to, to lose hope about in our world. But you and I can have hope. As Christians, we can have hope. And it's not a cross-your-fingers kind of hope. For decades, people in Michigan have crossed our fingers about the Detroit Lions. And two weeks ago on Sunday, when the lines were down 23 to 6 at halftime, and I went to bed because I was tired and I wasn't going to be able to stay awake, but, but I didn't give up hope, and so many people said, it's the same old lions. And I, when I got up in the morning, I put my glasses on, and I, I, I checked my phone, and hope against hope, they had won. That's not the kind of hope that we have as Christians. And quite frankly, 
the kind of hope that we have as Christians, that certain hope is not the kind of hope that we want for, for the Detroit Lions. Quite frankly, if you're honest with yourself, you don't, you don't want to have the absolute certainty that the Detroit Lions are going to win the Super Bowl. It wouldn't be any fun that way. It's, you know. It would be a fun for just a little bit. But the kind of hope that we want as Christians, the kind of hope that we have as Christians, is certain hope, absolute confidence that Christ died for us. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We have this hope in Christ, a hope that is confident, a hope that is not seeing and yet believing, knowing that Christ died for you and for me, knowing that God gives us a hope to share with the world around us. Coming back to 1 Peter, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. The world outside of the Christian faith is hopeless, but when the world asks us for our hope, we can explain it to them. We can share the hope of Christ with the world. We know that because of Christ, his death and his resurrection, we have hope not just for the lions and not for just for tomorrow, but hope for eternity. You can hope in a lot of things. You can hope for a new puppy for Christmas. You can hope for the Detroit Lions to win the Super Bowl. Or you can hope that this sermon is almost over, and it is. <laughs> But the hope that we have in Jesus is unlike any other hope. We have confidence, and we can hold fast to that hope. From Hebrews chapter 10, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So let's wrap up our Faithful Feeling sermon series. The mad, the sad, the glad, the afraid, it is all covered by the cross of Jesus. The anger, the, 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 the sadness, the madness, the, the, the fear, it's all covered by the cross of Jesus. His joy that we will experience for all eternity because of what he has done for us. And we can hope in that. Okay, comments, questions, thoughts. Yeah, Mark. Okay, so in this world we have uh, a, a short-term gain with a long-term pain, but with Jesus we have a, a short-term pain and a long-term gain. Did I get that right? Did I say it right? Good, thank you. All right. All right. So here's your task and question for the week, but I'm going to reverse them actually this week. I'm going to ask your question for the week first. The question of the week, how do you hope in God? Do you hope with confidence or do you hope with your fingers crossed? And the task for the week, hope without doubt. Have that confidence, that assurance. Hope without doubt. Pamela, will you please wrap us up with prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being near us in this time. We ask that you would move in our hearts through the message we just heard. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might have the courage to be doers of your word and not hearers only. May we be faithful witnesses of the love you have shown us in Christ. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. All right. And